There are women who will completely, completely become isolated and closed off to anybody else who might want their attention because they're, they are uh, hung up on one person who is not hung up on them, who is not exclusively hung up on them, who has not told, and it's not the man's fault. The man did not tell you that he was, you know, it's going to be you and him, that he wanted exclusive commitment, but giving your full commitment to someone who has not expressed you that that's what they want. One of my favorite content creators, we got a whole backstory We'll get into that in the episode. I'm just excited to have today's guest on. She is an author, a speaker. She's an influencer. She's one of my favorite content creators, Brave Hearts community. Let's show some love to Nikki Washington. How are you doing this evening? I'm good. How are you, sir? I'm wonderful, considering that we, we connected again. I know. I feel like I should have had a horn after that intro. Like, pew, 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 pew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your generous words. I appreciate it. Good to be connected yes for sure i wanted to well let me let me give a quick story and how i how god brought you to my remembrance okay (laughs) so one day i'm in my email i'm in my old because for those brave hearts for those who don't know i've been connected to nikki with uh the old brand right Mm -hmm. so she isn't a newer guest like we've been rocking on twitter for years so in this old email i'm checking it and i'm about to send an email for some odd reason i'm like why am i sending this from this old email and i hit the letter n and nikki washington your email came up wow and i was like nikki oh (laughs) let me see if she's still online and That's sure enough, up. yeah. I'm still out here doing my thing in these in these Instagram, Twitter, now Thread Street. <laughs> Thread Streets, yeah. How you feel about threads? I don't know. I'm still on the fence. So I was a I was an early adopter, I think. Mm-hmm. And I got in relatively quickly, but I still don't know because I wasn't really rocking with Twitter that much more anyway. So yeah. it kind of feels like more the same. I love everybody I'm connected to there, but I haven't found my rhythm yet. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if threads are still hanging on by a thread. I don't know. I think it's missing something, Nikki. I Just think. a little something. Have yeah. you done spill yet? Spill, S P I L. I've tried spill, and spill just not spilling. It's not, <laughs> it's not spilling anymore. It's not. Yeah, yeah. I think I posted like two or three things, and then I was like, I don't, I don't know. And maybe I'm just getting old because I'm like, I don't know what the young kids are doing nowadays. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's just a pleasure to be connected. Yes, for sure. So that's that's my little story for today. I wanted to talk to you about Christian dating in today's culture yeah. because there's so much going on. And especially I think about the time when I first met you to today. Yeah. And, and that was some years ago. So do you find dating harder for Christians today and in particular women? Sure. That's a good question. I think it's uh, nuanced. I don't think it's harder or easier. I think it's it's both, both and. So I think there are times where there are um, moments where we really are, it's it's an effortless thing. And then there's moments where it's like, ooh, this is, it's a lot going on. Like, so do I think dating is harder for Christian women? Um, I think it's yes and no. And I I say yes and no, because um, I don't, I don't believe the ratio lie. And I know some people are like, well, you know, there's 10 women to one man and five to two and three to seven. And there's all these different things. And the data is showing that people are becoming more connected, uh, that there are ha- there are more marriages on the rise, even though the percentage is still lower than what it used to be. There is progress. And I firmly believe that when you are in a room full of people, I don't care if it's one to 100, if that's supposed to be for you, it will be for you. So I believe that. Um, so I think that it can be easier in that you are able to whittle down faster what is and is not for you because you have a a barometer, right? We have the word of God that serves as our compass. So you know right away out of these hundred people, okay, who lines up with the word of God? Okay, that whittles it down. So I think it's easier to identify once you find it. I just think it's a matter of uh, finding it. But I really believe as simple as it sounds, and I know some people might wrestle with me on this one, but if you go outside, (laughs) get dressed and smile, it might be easier you know, then we think it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can say that again. I You said smile. Yeah. You'd be surprised. I, I just, it's funny you we are having this conversation, Sean, because I literally just did a panel discussion 
on my podcast, let me find out with a bunch of single people. And I asked them, the gentleman, I was like, so like, uh, what advice do you have for ladies? And we we're talking about it. And the guys were saying, Nikki, women should just go outside and be approachable. And I was like, well, let's say more. So they were basically like, it's not that we're all afraid of rejection. Sometimes we just need the green light by way of being approachable. So whether it's a smile, whether it's a hello, whether it's an eye contact, they are like, hey, just look approachable. <laughs> and so I think sometimes we can be, and I've been guilty of it, so in our zone that you are not approachable because you just have this stoic face on. And sometimes it's just a matter of smiling. Uh, yeah, I love that. And and again, it's, it's simple. You don't have to speak in tongues. <laughs> it, it's as simple as smiling because there was a lady that asked me one time, she said, why am I have a problem with dating? And I asked her, I said, what does your profile picture look like? Oh, what is it? What is your oh, profile picture? You came like? for a problem, <laughs> <laughs> Nikki. I had to ask her because she was like, "It's just so hard." And I'm thinking, for me, I remarried six months. Right, met my wife on Instagram, remarried. Okay. So I'm like, I don't think it can be too hard. So I asked her about the profile picture because statistics show also about smiling in your profile pic in your sure, profile yeah. picture sure, sure enough she I, was like I, yeah I, I could be yeah, smiling yeah I think also too um and I had I was talking to a friend of mine who is a psychologist and we were sharing he said something was so simple but so profound he said Nikki you'd be surprised how many people just don't know how to communicate and we're not taught when we come to at least when I came to Christ I was wasn't raised in the church but I was familiar my mom was what I would call Christmas Mother Day Easter Saint we would go you know every now and then but when I came into my own as a young adult, I started going to church, but, and I learned about sanctification. I learned about holiness. I learned about uh, study habits and spiritual disciplines, but no one said, this is how you conduct yourself as a single person. So I went into this space, not really knowing how to navigate it and thinking that it was, you know, sin to even say hello to someone that you were attracted to because there wasn't language given for it. And then I was part of True Love Waits movement. And even though my testimony remains the same, there was still this narrative of, of uh, treating your sexuality and your singleness like a dowry instead of like just a place where you are in life. So I think uh, to our singles credit, it's not that they don't want to, it's just that no one's had the conversation, you know, mm. or wasn't having a conversation. I think we're having it more now at case yeah. in point with this spot. Yes, for sure. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on, cause I was like, who better than Nikki to talk about this stuff? Listen, we done, we done been through a lot of seasons in life, y'all. <laughs> we done seen a whole lot of seasons. I've seen a whole different wave of singles leaders and stuff, and it's been good. We're getting healthier, and I'm I'm excited about that. Hey, man, that's, that's good to know because I think sometimes we need to, but not even sometimes, we need to really show our light to, sure. the, to the world because I think even by today's standards, I think sometimes Christians are a little afraid to let people know that oh yeah at least online maybe yeah i think people get feel like they're getting beat up sometimes mm -hmm. i remember when i first started doing singles ministry when i was uh, over a singles ministry at a mega church in atlanta and uh the landscape was different the way people talked about singleness is different you could talk about purity and waiting to marry till marriage to have sex and waiting until marriage to um really uh cohabitate and it was not taboo now if you say well i don't believe in uh, living with someone before you're married people what you mean are you judging like it's like no this is just what I choose to do it doesn't mean I'm judging what you choose to do this is just how I choose to live my life but yeah it, the landscape has definitely changed so um the bible is clear when it says you know wisdom it takes to win souls those who win souls are wise and I see why now because it's, it's a little hairy out in these streets <laughs> yeah lord knows so what are some obstacles that that most Christians face when it comes to dating huh so I, I, I think that sometimes, uh, it's a matter of making the connection. I think the obstacle is a lot of people don't know how to make the connection. When I was a singles leader, a lot of the complaints from women were, this feels like a women's meeting. This don't feel like a singles meeting. <laughs> and I'd be like, I don't know what y'all want me to do. I'm trying to, best I can, you know? And so a lot of women feel like they go to these events and it's a women's convention. It's not a singles mixer. I've heard that as a, um, as a gripe. I've also heard that, um, again, people feel like, uh, they don't know how to connect, where to connect, what to say, when you connect, where the boundaries are i think we have uh in times past not done a great job of helping people to know what their boundaries are and how to enforce those lovingly and so as a result of it people are kind of clumsily walking around in the space 
or people are just treating uh, dating and singleness as a Christian like they would when they weren't saved, which has its own set of problems of its own. So I think learning how to date as a Christian, quite frankly, learning how to date as a Christian and what are my boundaries. I also think it's just a matter of making sure that we understand what the expectation is, what your intention is for dating. Is it about just connect? Are you just trying to hang out with somebody or do you have intentions leading toward courtship? Are you trying to explore marriage? Do you just want to kick it, buddy? Like I think in order for everyone to understand what's happening, we all need to agree on the definition of what's happening and then we can proceed. So it's it's really a nuanced thing, but I, I think if we start with working definitions and then work our way in instead of reverse engineering it, mm -hmm. then we have a lot more success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was thinking about um, even when I was in singles ministry, like you said, the, the whole conversation has changed in, in the way we communicate with people. And, and I think even with dating, like what do people consider even dating as a Christian? What does <laughs> they, you know, like how do you really <laughs> define it? And then we get to talking about being unequally yoked because we can both say we're believers. But maybe you accepted Christ when you were six and you just like, yeah, I'm a Christian. You really don't practice, but you just like, yeah. So, yeah, it's easy yeah. to say I'm a Christian, too. But what does that look like when it comes to dating? Yeah. Yeah. I, re I remember uh, I was in a seminar once and it was for uh, my uh, company I was working for at the time. And they talked about uh, the definition of communication. And they said a lot of people assume that communication is when I said it. And he was like, but communication doesn't start until I understand what you said. And I think for us as Christians and as singles, courtship has to first have everyone aligned and agreed and said, okay, this is what the definition is of it is. And then once we know that, then we can have that conversation and create those boundaries. But until we know the definition, your definition of it might be one thing. My definition might be another thing. That's why I used to joke. I'd be like, hey, if if there anyone right now that if you shot, popped up online in a relationship would be mad at you because they don't know that you're not together. I was like, you know, all things being considered, have the conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You said, oh my God, I don't want to butcher this, but you said, communication is understanding what the other person said. Yeah, it doesn't. Cause a lot of times we think I said what I said and that's communication, but it's really, did I understand what you said? That's good. Cause I'm even learning in the process, Nikki, where when I'm talking to my wife, if she say something to me, I'll repeat it back to her. I'll be like, so what you said was. Yeah, that's good. That's healthy. Repeat back to her. Yeah. yeah, that's so healthy because sometimes we hear differently, especially, you know, when we in our feelings, you could have been like, Hey, you want, so you say you want to take it out of trash and you might be, I said 20 minutes, you know, you never know, you know, how things translate. So we hear according to our understanding. So that's, that's really healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I want to talk to you about therapy. And of course, therapy is, is very popular today, which is a good thing, right? But I want to ask you, would you date someone who isn't in therapy? Who is not? Who is not in therapy? Yeah. Um, well, see, it's that's it's complicated. <laughs> I'll say the reason why. My background is in counseling with the emphasis in religious studies. So I am an advocate, a champion of therapy. I'm not a therapist, let me be clear. Um, I am not a counselor. I just have experience in it. And so I believe that it is healthy. I believe that it is necessary. And I remember when I was an undergrad, my professor told me, he said, anyone who has a high touch point with people, whether you are a doctor, a lawyer, a police officer. Uh, whether you are a minister, a teacher, if you have a high touch point with people, you should be going to therapy at a minimum of once a month. He was like, because you have all of these people coming to you and you have all this pull on you and you need a safe place to decompress and to uh, replenish in that way. So I believe wholeheartedly therapy is as important as working out. And so, um, yes, there are people who marry people who don't work out, but after a while, you know, we all going to have to deal with the fallout of not working out. And, and the question then becomes, do you want to deal with that fallout? So I think you, if, if you're not in a, a traditional therapy session, you need to have a, a therapy session by way of your leadership, whether it's your mentor, your pastor, there needs to be someone that you can decompress to and download to and process through life with. So I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree because I remember going through my divorce and like I got therapy when I remarried, but there was so much that I knew that I went wrong with in the marriage, even before therapy. Wow. Like my ex-wife and I, like we had the conversation and I, I actually, I was like, what did I, what did I do wrong? I just wanted to hear honest answer, you know? 
And she was accurate because like I knew where I went wrong and she told me where I went wrong. And I, a lot of it was me. I married at 24. So a lot of times I was defensive, sure. stonewalling, not taking accountability, thinking I was, but I wasn't. <laughs> and, yeah. That's all there, of us at a time or two. Yeah. Right. And there was just things that I needed to work on. And through therapy, my my first therapist, she was so dope, but I was able to unpack so much, which makes me better now for the marriage that I'm in now. So oh, that's so good. Yeah. Have you heard about that book? I think it's called The Four Horsemen, I think. Talking about the Four Horsemen or the Four Subjects. It's basically they talk about uh with high predictability, there's data that that indicates if these four things are present in your marriage, you're more likely to be divorced. Mm-hmm. I saw a TED talk on it once and then I, I went and looked at the clip notes of the book. It was very insightful. When you said Stonewall and it reminded me of that. Yeah, you talk about Dr. John Gottman. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. He has, yes, it's called he called it the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I forget the four. One of them is stonewalling, but yeah. Contempt. Uh-huh. Stonewalling. Oh, I think resentment. I don't know. I I, I, is right. But yeah, no, it, I, yeah. I thought it was a great resource. So when you said it, I thought about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anybody don't come for me in a comment section or if you happen to know Dr. John Gottman or you know of the four horsemen, put them in a the comment section. Yes. Bro. We we want to be teachable. Teach us, please. <laughs> right. For sure. Let's let's help out the Christian man. Sure. And what can they do to make themselves more attractive in a dating pool? Um, I heard one of my friends say, um, he was at an age where, uh, he wants people to come, uh, already have done some work so that they can build together as opposed to being needing to all do the work. So, um, I think the same thing that men can do for themselves, same thing that women can do singles in general, um, as best you can do the work now so that when you connect, you're not having to unearth and, and rework things that you could have done on your own. You know? So I think it's stuff as simple as counseling is stuff as simple as uh, working on your health and not for the sake of vanity, for the sake of being your most, you know, fit self. That's something that I'm working on. Um, I think it's something that's working on your fine. I think there's very practical things that we can all do to make sure that we present our best selves because no one wants to be a burden to anyone when they come and connect. You want to be a benefit and not a, a burden. So making sure that we do the practical things like fitness, like uh, financial fitness, like um, spiritual uh, fitness, make sure your spiritual disciplines are in place. It is so much harder to create a spiritual discipline when you are connected and yoked with someone. So if you have it on the front end and you have those boundaries around that discipline, when you join with someone, it enhances your connection. So a couple of things, but um, from a st- practical standpoint, I think it's really just as much you can getting it together and then making sure that you are intentional with your pursuit. I think that's important too. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to jump into the bonus round with you. Okay. And these questions, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just, oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Nikki uncut, right? Okay. Let's get it. Okay. So let's get it. What is the biggest mistake you see women make in relationships? Ooh, Ooh sister don't come for me (laughs) I think the biggest mistake that I have made I'll put it on myself young Nikki 20 year old Nikki right I think one of the biggest mistakes that I have made is listening to words only and so it wasn't until I was maybe like again I'm telling y'all my truth not y'all because if I talk about y'all you're gonna get mad at me so I'm talking about me the biggest it wasn't until I was maybe like 29 or 30 where I realized words are nice we need words but you need those corresponding actions as silly and naive as it sounds some people say well, of course Nikki I know that way we know that but then you still hinge on to uh someone's words so in other words um uh, it's not just I think you're great I like you I love you it's corresponding actions to match the I like and I love because if it's an inward uh, belief it should be an outward expression right so there should be some sign as we say in church show some sign that you feel the way you say you do and so I think corresponding uh words and and making sure that you see the fruit of of what someone says that it is and then also um not uh how can I say this Hmm. making sure that when you are talking to someone or dating someone that you are um, not closed off until you're committed. What I mean by that is, yeah, let's talk about it. What I mean by that is um, I have seen, and this is not my experience, but I've seen it in my counseling sessions when I worked for a a full-time ministry, Mm -hmm. there are women who will completely, uh, completely become 
isolated and closed off to anybody else who might want their attention because they're, they are uh, hung up on one person who is not hung up on them, who is not exclusively hung up on them, who has not told, and it's not the man's fault. The man did not tell you that he was, you know, it's going to be you and him, that he wanted exclusive commitment, but giving your full commitment to someone who has not expressed you that that's what they want. There has to be again, language on the front end to say, Hey, I like you. I think this can go further. Do you like me? Can this go further? Okay. Let's explore that. But I know a lot of women in practicality I, I, that would say, Hey, you know, I, I thought it was this because you did all the date stuff, but did he expressly say to you, I want to be in a committed relationship or committed relationship leading to courtship with you. If that's not been said and he has not brought that up, then you have to, even though you're doing all the coupley stuff, you have to have the conversation so there can be an understanding instead of just assuming, because I've seen so many women be hurt on the back end because they didn't have the conversation and they assumed that they were in a relationship um, and they weren't. I saw a meme that I thought was hilarious. It had to be a few months back. And it said, um, if we together, it means that, uh, you in a relationship and I'm single. And there was a guy that posted it <laughs> Now he was being funny, but I just, all that to say, I think the two biggest mistakes are not asking those questions when uh, commitment is on the table. And like I said, just making sure that you are um, attentive to words and corresponding actions. Mm. I love that. And I hear that quite often. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so this, this is really some truth. Uh, funny story. When my wife and I was dating, she would not post me on any of her social media until I put a <laughs> ring on her finger. She was like, nope. I know that's right, wife. I know that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Listen, Mm-mm, no, no. Ain't gonna have no picture book on my page. <laughs> no, right. I, uh, uh, uh. Gotta my delete all the pictures. On my page. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So why do you think so many women fall for the words? Well, and when I so was funny. in my 20s, I just didn't know. Honestly, didn't know. I was very, I lived a very sheltered life. Um, I lived in a little bubble and I just didn't know what to look for. And again, because I had just gotten saved, no one said, this is what it looks like. And so I kind of took everything for face value. Um, and so I just thought, and, and it was enough for me because I didn't know. And it wasn't until later on, I was like, huh, because I'm a woman of my word. I assume that your word is attached to something. Cause my word is attached to something. If I tell you, Sean, I'm going to be on this call at seven o'clock. I'm going to be on this call at seven o'clock. Cause my word is attached to my actions, but I didn't realize everyone's word is not attached to their actions. And it doesn't make people bad. People it just means we all have a work to do and you have to decide whether you want to hitch your wagon to someone who does not keep the word. I feel like you're as good as your word. And I remember um, I'm from California. And I remember when I was little, we used to go to Dr. Price's church, uh, rest in peace, apostle price. Mm -hmm. And, but I remember he taught a lesson that I never forgot, Sean. He was basically like, you will have what you say, but how can you have what you say if you don't believe your word and you don't believe your word because you don't keep your word? Mm -hmm. I never forgot that. And in my heart of hearts, I said, okay, this is what it means to keep your word. So I keep my word because one, I think it's important. Two, I want my friends and family and loved ones to know I'm dependable. And three, I believe that you, if you have what you say, how can I even believe it if I don't keep my word? So I think some people just don't know what they don't know. And I think also some people just don't want to see it. Sometimes you like somebody so much that you're like, oh, well, you know, you convince yourself that it's something that it's not, if we're honest. So yeah. it's just really uh, being sober and having a right perspective. Mm, yeah. yeah, because I, I heard, I think, I can't remember the book I was reading, but they talked about uh, keeping your word. And they said that one of the reasons that lead to self-doubt is not keeping the word with yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah and it tears down your confidence yeah so it's more of like an inner inner thing it's an inner inner uh struggle because you told yourself you weren't gonna eat any more cookies past six yeah and yeah 7 30 and you're eating cookies again <laughs> <laughs> now you're in my business Sean. no i'm kidding <laughs> but it is it is a discipline you have to consistently beat and crucify that flesh and make sure that you're operating in the discipline of keeping your word to yourself you're absolutely right yeah. And don't get me wrong. I mean, we all fall short, you know, before. The oh, no, of course, are, of course. Are, you know, can, can you even really just trust yourself to be like, I said I was going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing it. Yeah. But I also think, too, that um, and I don't, I don't want uh, anybody watching to think that just because you fall short doesn't mean you haven't made progress. Mm. Um, I think it there's little by little. So, for example, I remember before the pandemic, I've always been active and I've always been mindful of uh, like diet and exercise, stuff like that. But I didn't realize until the pandemic, I was on the road doing a, a pair ministry and I was on the road doing marketplace ministry that I did not realize 
that for two years, I was not allowed to go into a gym because of my job. I was not, I was on the road. When I say on the road, Sean, I mean, seven days a week, 12 hours a day for two years straight. No, no kitchen because I'm from hotel to hotel, I'm uh, airplane, to airplane, like I'm gone. Right. And I took for granted before the pandemic, how consistent I was because I thought, oh, I'm not doing seven days a week, but I was still doing four. Oh, I'm not eating great, you know, hundred percent of the time, but I was still doing 70 until I got out of my routine and I couldn't do it at all. And then I was like, you know what? Uh, it, 10 minutes is better than no minutes. Right. But eating one is better than eating five. Start where you can start and work your way up. And I think sometimes we we miss those moments to encourage ourselves because you don't celebrate the small victories. And even though you're not where you want to be when it comes to keeping your word, the fact that you kept your word three out of 10 times and then it comes five out of 10 and seven out of 10, start where you can start and don't beat yourself up for what you're not. Just celebrate where you are. Mm, I love that. You said celebrate the small victories. I agree. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. Cause you got to have the grace for yourself. If not, yeah, you beat yourself up and the world going to already do that for you. So why beat yourself up? <laughs> you know, you can have a cookie. Go ahead. Yeah, just don't have two. <laughs> One Popeye strawberry biscuit, not two. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh my God, don't get me started. I didn't even think about them biscuits until you said <laughs> I tried them one time and I was like, oh, I can't do this. Y'all trying to give me. That's the devil. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, reel it in. From seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? So my father was not in my life. I was raised with a stepfather. So I've always had a father figure. Mm -hmm. Um, And seeing that dynamic, my father figure to this day, he is uh, uh, single-handedly responsible for creating a sense of stability and a sense of covering in my house when I met him when I was 11 that I didn't know I needed. Um, He's an honorable man. He is a man that takes care of his family and he is a man that is trustworthy. And so seeing the dynamic and really of a blended family and what that looks like, it was, it was challenging because you're seeing this woman who's used to being independent now having to merge her life and a man who is is called to cover this household and learning how to submit. So from watching their unit, I learned about what it looked like to have balance, what it looked like to submit, what it looked like to really um, compromise and meet in the middle because I had, my mom had four kids by the time she met my stepfather. I'm one of seven. So by the time they got together, mama had a whole life. She was all the way grown. And my stepfather had a whole life. He was all the way grown, traveling around with the military. So coming together, I really got to see them work out the tension of blending a family. And I think it's important to note that it was tension because I have friends who say they never saw their parents disagree. They never saw their parents fight. And so they get married and they don't know how to have healthy conflict because they never saw it. So I got to see what that conflict looked like. I'm like, okay, I got to see what to do. And then also too, in their separation, I got to see what not to do. So it was a healthy balance of seeing, okay, this is what good looks like. This is what not good looks like. This is what I need to work on. This is the thing I need to pray against because I don't want that in my bloodline. I think we don't, um, we don't acknowledge those things enough. Like everybody has the whole, you know, I just saw the way my, my uh, dad uh, wrapped his arms around my mama on the stove. And I just thought just show love. Yeah. Show love. But there's a hard side to marriage. So you have to see it all so that you know how to prop- properly compartmentalize and be able to have a healthy, sustainable relationship. So I saw how they re- resolved conflict. I saw how they didn't resolve conflict. I saw how they loved each other. Well, I saw how uh, they needed to love each other better. I saw how there were times when mom submitted to my stepfather. I saw there was times like, oh, somebody not submitting. I saw some times where he's not submitting to her. And I saw some times where he covered her for the greater good of the family, even though he was in the right. So you see all this conflict resolution and you go, okay, I know how to do this in a better way. So I'm grateful between them and my spiritual parents who've been married for like 40 years. I have been blessed to see a lot of healthy relationships and a lot of relationships come, overcome adversity. And I think uh, what I learned from the most is that fortitude and going the distance. I feel like we lack it to some degree in this generation. If, if I'm super honest, we lack fortitude, not everybody. Some people are, you know, trying to go the distance, but just in, in general, I think we, we, uh, we fall short a little bit of that. And so my prayer is that it'll, it'll be restored to us. Yes. Yes. I, I agree because I think with, with marriages today, uh, I mean, of course, people, they're not staying married long, yeah. but then I think what kind of bothers me a little bit when people say, I haven't seen a healthy marriage. Mm. Do, do you, do you believe that to be true? Do you believe that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm talking about maybe as far as I know, maybe 45 to 50% of people that I, I talk to, whether by coach or inboxes or whatever they say I never seen a healthy marriage Mm. and I was like do you really believe that people 
never seen a healthy marriage? I don't. So I can't speak to what, I mean, the people's testimonies are testimony, right? So I can't say, sure you have, but this <laughs> is what I think. I think you, fo- you find what you focus on. Mm. And so, uh, because you find what you focus on, it, it might mean you didn't have, uh, ready access to a healthy marriage. It might not have been readily available to you. So for me, case in point, my, uh, mom, my stepfather were married for like 25, 26 years before they separated. So mm. I saw a marriage in front of me that had ebbs and flows. I saw a lot of health and I saw a lot of unhealthy stuff. But when I couldn't look to their example, I also had a pastor and a first lady who I was close with. I'm like one of their daughters to this day. They've known me since I was 20 years old. And I, I've literally go, I'm one of the family. I go back to California and I sleep in the guest room and we all have a good time. I'm one of their children. Yeah. And, and they have one of the healthiest marriages I've ever seen in my life. Now I could have just looked at the household representatives and said, Oh, well, marriage kind of that. But I chose to look at, and naturally I'm optimistic anyway, but I chose to find those healthy examples if they weren't in my house. Okay. Are they in my community? If they're not in my community, okay. Are they afar? Are they on TV? Do I see them? And I know you don't see everything that people present to you. So we know the optics are different, but I think it's where you find it. If you, if you look long enough, I think you'll find it. But, um, I think sometimes what people are really trying to say is maybe in their household, they didn't see it, Mm -hmm. but you have to sometimes go outside of your norm in order to, to, to get what you need. You haven't, seen it because it's not in front of you but it doesn't mean it's not there you know yeah yeah because sometimes i think especially for today's culture i think if it doesn't look like jay-z and beyonce then (laughs) (laughs) i I talked about those optics on um on one of my episodes Mm -hmm. because um i i feel like and uh, the the uh, consensus was the same that sometimes in church we get it a little different and we think that you know he got the jay-z beyonce they gotta he gotta be a preacher i gotta be a preacher he gotta be a musician i gotta be a singer he gotta be a teacher i gotta be a like that's i don't know that that is what purpose necessarily has to look like like i work in corporate spaces too and i've never met an accountant that said i can only marry another like cpa i haven't met someone who who works at you know who owns a franchise like i only marry another franchisee like Like only in the church do we assume that you have to have the same skill set in order to be equally yoked. And I don't know that I think that's what equally yoked means. I'm not saying it's wrong. (laughs) I'm not saying it's wrong. All I'm saying is I I think we box ourselves in with the assumption that just because you do this, you have to marry someone who does that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You're right about that because that's, you know, that's. uh... Yeah. Christianese, that's Christian talk, you know. <laughs> I love you. everybody who is. I love y'all. I'm not saying it's wrong. I want that to be abundantly clear. All I'm saying is, I take the take the box off. And I think for those who are single, um, yeah. if you if you're like, because I know people like that, Sean, who are like, I only want to marry a musician, or I only want to marry a doctor, I want to marry. A I'm like, if you just open it up a little bit, you might be surprised what God has for you. Yes, because a lot of times we have certain uh, requirements. And, you yeah. know, I, I've heard people say, I can't date a man unless he's over 5'10". You know, <laughs> and I just feel like, oh my God. No, you know? uh-uh. I think for, for me anyway, I believe that uh, my requirements are what God's requirements are, right? So I fully believe that, now don't get me wrong, I'm not going to be so deep to where I will say don't like what you like. If you like, you know, if you like these strapping shoulders and and, ha- and six foot two and that's your bag, get it. Because you have to like what you look at every morning when you wake up, right? True. But I also would caution against hanging your hat on things that are, are carnal and things that are surface. Um, but, but again, I'm not the person who's going to tell women not to like what you like because we don't tell men not to like what they like. If a man, if a man says, well, I'm just not attracted to her, no one says to the man, well, you know, just look past it. But with women, we quick to be like, girl, it don't matter if you're not yeah. six, but just look past it. So all things being equal, like what you like, I'm just saying, if the voice of the Lord is clear and you know without a shadow of doubt in your mind that you are looking at a solid man, maybe he's not as tall or maybe I'm just saying consider all. That's all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Because to me, just as a man, I I don't think you're going to get everything in the package that you want. Yeah. I, I just don't. <laughs> I, I, and, and I think that and this is another conversation for another time, <laughs> but I think, you know, at least. 80 percent you know you pass and you got a b you know what I'm saying they got 80 percent of what you want i mean you know b's i'll take a b right <laughs> <laughs> so. you, are you calling the people b students Sean? 
Hey, I'm just saying some people can yeah. some people some, some people uh get D's, you know. That's but you know what? When you really love somebody, they A to you, baby. Listen, come on now. You, when you really love somebody, it don't matter what I don't if I don't care what nobody else thinks. If that's person, that's my person. That's my, I'm riding it till the wheels fall off. So, you know, everybody, and everybody's likes are different. You might not be someone's cup of tea. Someone might not be your cup of tea. So I think what's a, what's an A student to some people might be different to others. So I just want to caution people not to hang your hat on things that are material and surface and Kevin Samuel-esque, you know, God rest his soul. You know what I'm saying? Just, it, it's got to be deeper than that. Yeah. Because sometimes people can't get past those physical attributes and they willing to put up with whatever. They just like, I don't know if I can get any better than this. Oh, yeah. And, and, I and, think there's a balance. Yeah, I agree. Last question. Is it easier to love yourself or someone else? Oh, is it easy to love yourself or someone else? That's a good question, Sean. This is what I think. I think when you love yourself, you naturally will love someone else. I don't believe that you can love yourself, love someone else and you don't love who you are. I don't believe that 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 you can really, um, the Bible is clear, love your neighbor as yourself. yourself, right? So if that be the case, how can you love your neighbor if you don't love yourself? You don't know what it is. So I believe that uh, if it's, it's easy to love when you know who you are and you're rooted in God and you're allowing him to, to mold and make, make and shape you because you're fashioned after his image. You're an image bearer of Christ. So to all that to say, I think if you love yourself first, then you will naturally love other people. Mm -hmm. So at what point in Nikki's life did she start to love herself? Huh? That's a good question. I think for me, um, how can I say, I don't think that I was aware that I didn't love myself. Because mm -hmm. I always, my mom always uh, put, helped to make sure that we had a healthy dose of identity. And she always, like, I remember, even though my mom wasn't consistent in church, she always pointed us back to the gospel. So I didn't find my worth in sports because I didn't play sports in high school. And I didn't find my worth in, um, you know, I did cheering when I was really little, but I didn't, I didn't find my worth in any kind of skill or talent. So I had nothing to hang my hat on. It couldn't be, oh, Nikki's a great, you know, this or a great that. It was just me. And so even when I started to be to discover my talents and I started to win awards for my talents and stuff like that, I still never hung my hat on it. I always hung my hat on who God said I was. So it was maybe I'd say 22, 23, where I realized, oh, wow, God loves me. And he sees value in me. He sees worth in me. And he chose me. Like it took a while for me to, to understand how he chose me. I always feel like I had a decent sense of self-worth, but it, I came into my own, if you will, when I realized exactly how God chose me. And it wasn't because I was so great, so good, but because his goodness was on the inside of me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So after I began to come into that, I was like, oh, oh, what? well, if God loves me, Mm -hmm. he's the creator of us, oh, I must be a little song, song, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you really, it really is that, deep for me because for a long time Sean I wrestled with the why God why you choose me like out of all the people and it would be the craziest things like I would go and and serve in ministry and it would be 4,000 people in the room and God would just raise me up and I would not want it I would not ask for it I was not interested in it my name would just come up in conversations and people would call me I would just go and do tv and do these videos and go into this show and that show. and I had and I was not looking for any of it and I realized and I remember one of my friends, they, they used to tell me, Nikki, you just can't hide. It's just what God has for you. But I am one of those people. I am totally content in the background. I will produce your show. I will write your bylaws. I will administrate your stuff. And God continues to say, okay, no, I want you to do this. I want to push you here. And I really believe, again, it's not because I'm so special. It's because I gave him my submitted yes. Mm -hmm. And because I believe in faithfulness. If anybody watching this wants the cheat code to ministry, be faithful. If you are faithful and not from a self-serving place and not from a place of um, agenda, but like purely faithful because you want to see God's kingdom come to the earth, I promise you, God honors faithfulness. And so for me, I learned to love myself. I learned to grow into who I am because I got rooted in the word of God. And I realized that if God saw value in me, who am I to not see value in me? So it's not that we don't wrestle with it. Everybody wrestles with a moment where you look in the mirror and you're like, mm, I'm not really feeling it today. Or you're like, ah, imposter syndrome or whatever the case may be. But I always go back to a baseline. And it's always like, this is what God says about me. This is why God loves me. And you know what? Who am I to argue with God? Mm. Amen to that. I'm I love saying. it. 
<laughs> You're perfectly and wonderfully made, Sean. I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, hey, man, I, that's beautiful. Well, it's been a, a phenomenal episode. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to be a guest and for us to reconnect. And I also, I want to acknowledge you, Nikki, for staying the course, for just being consistent, uh, always having a servant's heart. You know, I, I never got to meet you in person, but I just always felt like you were good people. Oh, um, thank you so much for that. And thank you for this platform. I've watched you from afar for years. And like, we all came from the same group of people, right? And I was just like, when I got your email, I was like, he out there just helping us. He done went and got married, but he's still reaching back to help us. Just, I just want you to know, thank you for your faithfulness to the singles community, my brother. I really do appreciate I believe God honors sacrifice. And so thank you for your sacrifice. Cause you know, you don't have to take away from your family time to do this for us, but mm -hmm. the fact that you do, I'm sure your, your viewers are blessed by it every time you do it. So thank you for that. Yes, for sure. I appreciate it because even as we record, my wife is watching our kids. So um I'm grateful for that that she believes yes. in the vision um that she it, actually it makes a difference yeah right yeah women are amazing i love women i love black women i love every i love everybody but women are uh, i, I know that's right you better lay on that horn black women he said what <laughs> yeah. he said we black women encouraged <laughs> yeah y'all are amazing and i don't think you all hear it enough I, I, you know i know you got mother's day and all of the good stuff but <laughs> i i you know we need to show more love um, to our sisters. But thanks again, Bravehearts community. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you are watching this via YouTube, uh, leave a comment below. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Make sure that you share this video with someone who might be in need. Somebody they might be a, a Christian brother or sister who might need to hear this. Um, Nikki has great content as well. And I got to make sure to get your information as well. Uh, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you, Nikki. Okay, so you can find me at Nick. I always mess it up, so I'm trying to say it slow. Nick, N-I-K-K, -K, last name Washington on Instagram. It's Nick Wash on TikTok. And then I have a Facebook page. I don't really use it that much. And I have Twitter and, and threads, and I honestly don't. So you're most likely to catch me on TikTok or Instagram. So holla at your girl, and I'd be glad to connect with you there. Okay, for sure. Brave Hearts community, you heard it here. Make sure you connect with Nikki. If you are listening to this via podcast, leave a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you by doing so. Put you in the drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free things? This is Sean Heineman with special guests. <laughs> I cannot hear you. You're just supposed to say Nikki Washington. I we couldn't hear. I was like, I heard all her was special guests. It was like you broke up. I was like, what did you say? Is he talking to me? <laughs> yeah. This is all back one more time. Bro. Run it back one more time. Hold yeah. on. Hold on. Yeah, let's let's run this back. This is Sean Heineman with special guest. Nikki Washington. All right, Brave Hearts community. Take care. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of A Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarried, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here, but anyway, go watch another video.